More about the Treaty of Saginaw. At the close of the final council, General Cass held with the Chippewa Indians a copy of the Saginaw Treaty and was given to the Indians for preservation. This document was in the possession of their descendants for well over a century. During those first post-treaty years, the Indians were living in bark wigwams and, even though they could not read the document, they considered it of significant value to preserve it. The treaty came into the possession of descendants of Notch Chicom, an Indian referred to in 1895 by Harlan Smith, an archaeologist, as a real old Saginaw chief who was dead before Smith's time. Natchikom was one of the more prosperous Indians. He was listed in 1854 as a land buyer in Buena Vista. Section 2, one of his descendants, Estella Squanda, is the widow of the late Reverend John Silas, a Chippewa Methodist minister in Iosco County. The treaty was in their family's possession until 1948 when, while it was being shown to a group of people, some unkind person made off with it. In 1934, the Reverend Mrs. Mr. Silas had brought the Treaty of Saginaw where a photocopy was made of it. Mrs. Rockwell M. Kempton presented the photocopy to the Hoyt Library where it was on display. Due to being folded for many years, the treaty was in rather bad condition. When it was laid out to be copied, the pieces were not all properly aligned, and thus it is rather difficult to read the photocopy. The general's name appears where the signature should be but does not resemble the authentic cast signature. It is fortunate that the 1934 copy was made, not only because of the Indian's copy had been lost, but also because the copy or copies which cast forwarded to the Secretary of War in Washington, D.C. cannot be located there. <laughs> only printed copies are available. In a letter dated December 3, 1964, Dr. Robert H. Bomer, acting archivist at the National Archives, states in part concerning the Treaty of the Saginaw Treaty, our staff has completed a careful and extensive search of the Records Bureau of Indian Affairs and of the War Department and the National Archives, but has found little information about the history of this treaty and the distribution of the signed copies. It is a matter of record that on September 10, 1819, General Cass forwarded a copy of to the Secretary of War. Its receipt was acknowledged by a letter on October 21, 1819, and with the exception of the supplementary article of request by the Indians, the treaty was ratified March 2, 1820, um, and regarding this supplementary article, some of these requests had been made by the Indians and rejected by the Senate on three previous occasions. A fact no doubt known to both the Indians and caste, yet the commissioner could well afford to allow its conditional insertion since it um, acted as an inducement to improve the attitude of the Indians. And Mr. Joseph Shreve of Tamath Township, Saginaw County, has in his possession a handwritten copy of the Treaty of Saginaw. It is not known who made this copy. It is written on ruled paper with a fine pen and is a specimen of excellent penmanship. Mr. Shreve's ancestors, the Morris family of Morrisville, resided in the Flint River area for several generations, not far from Panogining, an Indian village where Indians had lived since time immemorial. It is possible that some members of the family made this copy for one of the Indians. On the other hand, it may have been copied from a printed version, but if a printed copy was available, it would seem unlikely that anyone would copy it by hand. Its origin presently is at least a minor mystery. Article 3 of the Treaty of Saginaw says there shall be reserved for the use of each person here and after mentioned, which persons are all Indian by descent, for the use of John Riley, Peter Riley, and James Riley, 640 acres for each. These men were of mixed blood sons of Chippewa women and James S. B. Riley, who was an Indian trader along the Lake Huron shore during the 1780s. About 1800, or shortly thereafter, he returned to his home in Schenectady, New York, where he was elected sheriff. At the time of the treaty, he was postmaster there, and later he was referred to as judge. In 1819, he was present at the treaty negotiations and had enough influence to have a section of land assigned to each of his sons. John had 640 acres on the east side of the river, where the main business district of Bay City is now located. And in 1837, the Saginaw Bay Company bought his land reportedly for $30,000. His father had met him in Detroit and advised him to sell the land. Peter received a section of land beginning above the apple trees on the west side of the river, and this is where Carleton is located. Reserve Avenue constitutes um, the southwest line of the Peter Riley Reserve. 
James Riley had 640 acres assigned to him on the east side of the river in the area of South Washington Avenue and Ezra Rust Drive. On the Cuckallan River in Bay City, there was a 640-acre tract for the children of Bakotondin. How many children there were is not stated. Quite probably there were, they were of mixed blood also. On the east side of the river in Zawaki Township, opposite the present city of Zawaki, a tract including what was then an island, later known as Crow Island, was assigned to Kishkako the Crow. He was arrogant and of violent temper and would commit an outrage against anyone red or white. He was arrested after an act of violence and died in a Detroit prison. That he was the only full-blooded Indian to obtain a reserve for his own use, if indeed he was full-blooded. Louis Campo stated that Kish Kako was a fine-looking fellow who appeared to have white blood. He lived in a small log house, had a hen house, and in imitated the whites to quite an extent. Still, under Article 3, we have 11 reserves of 640 acres each for 11 persons of Indian names, which were granted because of the request or insistence of Jacob Smith, the fur trader. Some of the 11 recipients were named Neom, chief of Flint River tribe, living near the southwest line of the 1819 treaty. Neomi was a, a close friend of Jacob Smith. Some, if not all of the others, may well have been children of Smith by one or more Indian women. While he was not a, on Commissioner Cass's staff, Smith, like James V.S. Riley, made good personal use of his influence over the Indians. Showing the lack of good faith on the part of the authorities, there was uh, a supplemental article to the above treaty which the Chippewas insisted on and which General Cass submitted to President Monroe and he, in turn, to the Senate for ratification. It was simply cut out of the treaty, uh, treaty excuse me, by the Senate, and the claimants received nothing. This supplemental article reads as follows. The Chippewa Indians, being desirous to reward Dr. William Brown of Detroit for the professional services which he has rendered to them for 20 years past, request that three sections of land be granted to him and his heirs in the tract of county hereby ceded. <clears throat> the same request was urged at the Treaty of Detroit in the year 1807, at the treaty concluded at the foot of the rapids of the Miami in the year 1817 and at the Treaty of St. Mary's in the year 1818 and is now renewed by them in the confident hope that the land herein granted will be confirmed to him. The Chippewa Indians do also grant to Henry Connor and, late, and to um, James Connor, who were taken prisoners by them in early life and lived with them many years and to their heirs 1,280 acres of land. The said Indians do also grant to Peter W. K. Nags, George Nags, and Jack Godfroy, who had been adopted by them, and to their heirs, 640 acres of land each. The said Indians further requested that the twelve sections of land be sold in the same manner and upon the same terms as the lands of the United States are sold, and the proceeds appropriated under the direction of the President of the United States for the purpose of making roads to and through their reservations. The said Indians have also requested the sum of uh, $1,298,000, uh, no, excuse me, that's, that's wrong, $1,298.20 be paid to Conrad Tenick as compensation for property taken by them at Saginaw in the year 1812. The Commissioner of the United States has admitted these grants and requests into this article, but not being authorized to exceed uh, to them on the part of the United States. He reserves the same to the President of the United States and to the Senate thereof for their decision. But it is hereby expressly understood and declared that the ratification or rejection of this article or any part thereof is not to affect any other article of this treaty. Signed, Lewis Cass, um, and uh, witnessed by John L. Lieb, Secretary. The request would indicate that the Indians wished to reward the persons who had befriended them as well as those whom they themselves had offended in the past, a showing of kindness and remorse which is so often lacking in human nature. Um, whiskey drinking during the treaty negotiations was frequent and the statement is sometimes made that Cass gave the Indians so much whiskey that they did know not, not know what they were doing. Such a statement is hardly fair to General Cass or to the Indians. The general was fair, as the government would let him be, and we should not think of the chiefs and, and uh, headmen as a pack of drunken Indians. A number of traders were present, which would uh, mean 
that some drinking was done, but only one case of serious intoxication during the negotiation was reported, and this case may well have been deliberate on the part of the traders. The presence of a large number of intoxicated Indians would have created a dangerous situation. Getting the Indians drunk would not have been necessary, even if General Cass had planned to misrepresent the contents of the treaty, because drunk or sober, the Indians could not have discerned what was in the treaty since they could not read it. They depended entirely on what they were told concerning the treaty. No doubt the thought of promised gifts, the influence of Jacob Smith and other traders had more to do with the Indians' acceptance of the treaty than drinking whiskey did. Louis Campo reports that after the treaty was signed, Cass opened five barrels of whiskey for the Indians and Campo, disgruntled because he felt he had been treated unfairly in a decision Cass had made, opened ten barrels of his own whiskey, and had two men with dippers pass it out to the Indians, and he states that the Indians drank to fearful excess, but this incident occurred after the treaty was signed. Thus, it had no influence on the outcome of the negotiations. One factor to consider is the influence some of the traders had over the Indians for the most part. The traders were trusted and may well have advised the Indians to be agreeable. We must remember that the traders had much to gain from acceptance of the treaty by the Indians. If the negotiations had failed, Cass would have taken the government's silver back to Detroit and the traders could not have gotten any from the Indians. Once the treaty was signed, the United States government began to sell land to settlers and this angered the Indians. They realized, uh, for perhaps the first time, the spoken word of the white man assuring them they could continue hunting in the forest and the written word, which gave title to the land of, to the government, could carry two different meanings. Although General Cass had said the Indians could go on uh, to and fro from their wigwams without interference, the white settlers did not want Indians walking across their property. The Indians became unruly, interfering with uh, surveyors who were attempting to extend the public surveys over the region. Pressure was put on the government by the surveyors for protection and in 1822 the War Department decided to establish a military fort at Saginaw. On May 22, 1822, General Winfrey Field Scott sent an order to Colonel Ninian Pink Pinckney of the 3rd Infantry at Green Bay, Wisconsin to select two companies and go to Saginaw. And at this point I'll stop because I have a video already on here about Fort Saginaw and its, uh, and its history. So I will try to put a link to that in the description so that you can check out that, that video too. Thanks for stopping by like and give a thumbs up and uh, subscribe and again thanks for stopping god bless and have a good night